1940, the renowned mathematician Godfrey Harold Hardy wrote a mathematician's apology, a compelling essay arguing that mathematics hold aesthetic beauty independently of practical uses. Hardy supports his case with two elegant mathematical gems, the irrationality of the square root of two and the infinitude of prime numbers. What's your take on these mathematical masterpieces? Do they strike you as beautiful? Have you explored the classical proofs for these statements? Here at the Academy of Useless Ideas, although we may not see eye to eye with all of Hardy's arguments, we do stand alongside him in recognizing the inherent beauty of mathematics, even in its seemingly pointless pursuits. Furthermore, we hold the belief that the primary aim of a proof isn't merely to assert truth, but to unravel the mysteries woven into mathematical entities. If proving theorems were just about stating facts, a single proof would quench your intellectual curiosity. However, each proof unfurls distinct relationships between mathematical concepts. Today, our focus centers on Furstenberg's proof of the infinitude of primes. Our aspiration is that this esoteric proof sparks a discussion on the essence of beautiful proofs. How can they shed light on or cloud mathematical relationships and the origins of these intriguing proofs? Without further ado, let's delve into the intricacies of the proof. Let's kick off by envisioning arithmetic through the lens of a 12-hour clock. Imagine the clock reads 9 hours and we add 5 more hours. Instead of landing at 14, we circle back to 2. This looping effect occurs because the clock numbers repeat every 12 units. Now, let's extend this idea to clocks with any non-zero numbers of hours. Consider a clock with 5 hours. If we go forward 3 hours and then multiply that by 3, we find ourselves at 4. Rather than using the term clock arithmetic, mathematicians have adopted the more sophisticated phrase modular arithmetic. In modular arithmetic, the modulus refers to the size of the clock, and we say two numbers are congruent if their difference is a multiple of the modulus. For instance, 2 and 17 are congruent modulo 5 because 17 minus 2 equals 15, which is a multiple of 5. Now, let's delve into Forstenberg's explanation of arithmetic sequences. For a pair of integers a and b, the arithmetic sequence s a b encompasses all numbers that are congruent to b module a. Although this definition might appear intricate initially, a few examples can provide clarity. Consider S30, which by definition consists of all multiples of 3, negative 6, negative 3, 0, 3, 6, and so forth. Likewise, examine S61, which incorporates all numbers congruent to 1 modulo 6, negative 5, 1, 7, 13, and so on. Not too daunting, is it? Now, let's explore Furstenberg's definition of open and closed sets. While the term open and closed might trigger thoughts of topological spaces for some viewers, it's essential to note that you don't need any prior knowledge of that mathematical structure to grasp the proof. Furstenberg characterizes an open set as a collection of integers that can be expressed as an arbitrary union of arithmetic sequences. Consider, for instance, the set of elements that are either multiples of 3 or congruent to 1 modulo 6. This set is deemed open since we can represent it as the union of S30 and S61. Additionally, Furstenberg contends that the absence of any arithmetic sequences in the union should yield the empty set, leading him to consider the empty set itself as open. Similarly, he terms a set closed if it stands as the complement of an open set. Take the set of elements not multiples of 5, for example. It is classified as a closed set because it forms the complement of S50. 
Let's test our understanding with a few questions. Is the set of multiples of 3 open? Is it closed? Now consider the set of integers that are not multiples of 3. Is it open or closed? Feel free to pause the video until you arrive to your answers. If you find yourself puzzled, don't hesitate to let us know. Your questions are valuable in refining our explanations. Remember, confusion often precedes understanding. The key when perplexed is to generate as many questions as possible. As you formulate inquiries, you become more conscious of what might be unclear. Take your time, the remainder of the video awaits you when you are prepared to continue. Let's unravel these questions and find out how you did. The sets of multiples of 3 is represented as S30 and, as per its definition, it's inherently open. On the flip side, the set of non-multiples of 3 is the complement of S30, earning it the status of a closed set. Now, here is where it gets interesting. S30 itself is also a closed set. Did you foresee that twist? Or did our tricky question catch you off guard? Regardless, we are here for the enjoyment, and a well-placed plot twist always spices up the narrative. Intriguingly, the complement of S30 can be expressed as the union of S31 and S32, constituting an open set due to the union of two arithmetic sequences. As its complement is open, S30 proudly earns its classification as a closed set. Let's extend our example to a broader context and notice that any arithmetic sequence is not just open, but also closed. Can you see why? If it's not clear, feel free to pause the video, take your time, and resume when you are ready. One fascinating aspect often misconstrued about mathematics is that there is no rush to solve problems. Think of math like a board game tucked away in the attic, waiting to be rediscovered whenever the mood strikes. But let's get back on track. The arithmetic progression SAB earns its closed status when it forms the complement of an open set resulting from the union of S, A, C, where C ranges from 1 to A, excluding B. Share any questions or thoughts on this, and if you can suggest a simpler or better way to express this lemma, we're all ears. So it seems that certain subsets can play both sides, being both open and closed. But does this necessarily mean that every open set must also be closed? What's your perspective on this? Can you come up with an open set that is not closed? How about a closed set that is not open? Or what about a set that is neither open nor closed? Even unanswered questions contribute to our understanding. For instance, without resolving these inquiries, we find ourselves considering all possibilities. A set could be open and closed, open but not closed, closed but not open, and neither open nor closed. A swift observation worth noting is that not all sets qualify as open, considering that every arithmetic progression is infinite and open sets are unions of arithmetic progressions. We deduce that non-empty open sets must also be infinite. Therefore, we can affirm that finite sets do not fall under the category of open sets. Let's further explore this concept and see where it takes us. How about examining the intersection of two arithmetic sequences? Is it open? Let's explore some specific instances. First, let's consider the intersection of S31 and S62. By examining these two sets, we conclude that such intersection is the empty set, which by definition is open. Let's try some other example. What about the intersection of S31 and S52? Is it open? Upon closer inspection, we notice that the intersection is indeed an arithmetic sequence in itself, namely S157, which by definition is also open. 
Exploring this concept suggests that the intersection of two arithmetic sequences, either an arithmetic sequence itself or the empty set. What are your thoughts on this conjecture? Does it resonate with any other classical results you've encountered? The esteemed mathematician Alexander Grothendieck once remarked, one should never try to prove anything that is not almost obvious. Is this conjecture almost obvious enough to be proven? We assert the truth of the statement, but leave it as an exercise for the viewer. Share your approach to proving this result in the comments section or on Discord. With these principles in mind, let's distill three key properties of open sets. First, both the empty set and the entire set of integers qualify as open. Second, the union of any collection of open sets is also an open set. Third, the intersection of a finite number of open sets remains open. It's worth noting that the arbitrary intersection of open sets is not necessarily open. Can you discern the reason behind this limitation? These properties extend to dual characteristics of closed sets, easily verified through complements and the application of the Morgan laws. Specifically, the empty set and the entire set of integers are closed. The intersection of any collection of closed sets is closed, and the union of a finite number of closed sets is closed. Viewers familiar with topology will recognize these properties as the definition of a topology. A topology over a set X is a collection of subsets of X that satisfies the stated properties. A set endowed with a topology is referred as a topological space. Delving deeply into topological spaces would take us too far from our goal of proving that prime numbers are infinite. Nevertheless, Let's at the very least mention that, although it might not be immediately apparent from its definition, the properties of a topological space emerge from extracting the essential conditions for defining continuity. Let's refocus and explore how we can establish the infinitude of primes using these definitions. To begin, let's examine the union of all arithmetic progressions in the form of sp0, where p is a prime number. It's crucial to note that this union includes all integers except for 1 and negative 1. The exclusion of these two numbers is warranted by the fact that every integer, excluding 1 and negative 1, possess a prime factor. As per the definition, this union is deemed open. Now, ponder this. Is this set closed as well? Take your time to contemplate this, pause the video, and share your answers. Even if you are just along for the journey, engaging with these problems enhances the experience. As it happens, the complement of this set forms a non-empty infinite set, and consequently, it cannot be open. Therefore, we deduce that the original set itself cannot be closed. Now, for the sake of a contradiction, let's assume that there are only finitely many primes. Considering that every element in the union corresponds to an arithmetic progression, and that arithmetic progressions are known to be closed, under this hypothetical scenario of finite primes, we would assert that the union itself is closed. However, this clashes with our earlier realization that the union cannot be closed, leading us to a contradiction. Hence, we are compelled to infer that there must, indeed, be infinitely many primes. Quite an intriguing turn of events, isn't it? If you are familiar with topology, one could outline the proof in the following manner. Equip the integers with the topology induced by arithmetic sequences. Demonstrate that every arithmetic sequence is both an open and a closed set within that topology. Establish that every open set must be infinite. Note that the union of multiples of all primes constitutes all numbers except for 1 and negative 1. This set is open but not closed, as its complement is finite. If primes were finite, this set would be a finite union of closed sets, from where we would conclude that the set is closed, leading to a contradiction. 
However, even if topology is a foreign concept, we hoped that the proof was accessible. Was the explanation clear? Did you find the proof convincing? Are there any uncertainties or points requiring further clarification? We aimed to present the proof in the most straightforward manner, and your feedback is invaluable. On the flip side, it's conceivable that our explanation was overly clear. Why might this be problematic, you wonder? An excessively lucid explanation can create an illusion of comprehension. It's not until days later, during attempts to reproduce the argument, that the realization dawns on individuals that their understanding wasn't as robust as they thought. Have you ever left a lecture confident in your grasp of the material, only to find yourself riddled with confusion during the following test? To avoid such situations, I challenge myself by writing out proofs independently, refraining from consulting any materials. Encountering obstacles helps me identify areas where my understanding falls short. So, can you tackle writing this proof unassisted? Give it a shot and share your experience in the comments section or on Discord. Regardless, now that you've grasped the proof, it's time to ponder the questions we posed at the outset. How do you believe Furstenberg discovered this proof? Does the proof strike you as confusing or illuminating? Would you describe it as beautiful? Share your thoughts in the comments section or on Discord. We are keen to hear your perspectives. In the meantime, stay mathy and awesome.